My name is Ariane Rohrbach, and I work for DHL as a data engineer. And I will talk to you a little bit today about some aspects of um, programming data ingestion jobs in Scala. And yeah, um, let's get started. So why would we use Scala for data ingestion jobs? Uh, you can imagine like moving around data. Scala, um, Scala is used as pretty useful for that. Um, for one of the major reasons for us at DHL is its integration with Spark. Um, Spark is a big data processing framework. Maybe some of you are familiar with it also from your jobs. And also we use uh, data bricks as a platform. So Scala is just a natural choice uh, for us to program such jobs. Also, kind of going with point number one, Scala has some nice performance and concurrency features. For example, uh, the famous functional programming paradigms and the immutability makes it really nice to write concurrent and parallel code. So that's also how we like it. And also, Scala syntax is pretty expressive, and we have a strong type system which allows us to write code also quite maintainable. Um, okay, like if we think about the use case, I said we would talk about data ingestion job. Um, we can imagine something like this: we have a you know, Databricks workspace, and there we are deploying a job to our data ingestion job. And this job will be processing data from some source system, maybe from some partner organization that has some CSV data there that we would like to pick up. And then, yeah, um, ingest it, maybe transform it, uh, and then also put it to some landing storage. So, classic ETL extracts transform mode kind of thing. Also, one of the requirements we would like to be fulfilled is that our job is reusable, so if we have another partner that we would like to hook on, um, we would like to be able to do this without writing another custom job that does it. But instead we have maybe a configuration file that we deploy with our jar, and then this job will just do its magic and make some schedule. Um, also, we would like our job to scale, so in the sense that, um, first of all, the data gets more, but also, let's say, our partner, one of them, has different kinds of CSV files there. We would like to have multiple tasks uh, that run in parallel to ingest this data. I'll talk about tasks a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so what features would such ingestion job need? So there's four main features. For one, the configuration that I already mentioned. So we want to be able to give some simple configurations to this job that it understands and then does something with it. And then the third session, this is kind of like our entry point for our application of Databricks, so it's just something that is always needed. <coughs> and then the ingestion task that I mentioned um, it has, uh, that's basically where most of our programming will happen. This is act uh, actually what um, yeah, handles the data. And then also a logging feature because if we have an ingestion job that processes data, we also want to be sure that we can trace whether our job is doing what we expect it to do. And if there's something wrong, we would like to be able to see that. <coughs> Um, so I will show you some example configuration files, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so you can see, for example, if you'd like to specify something like this, I can say, okay, I have an input path, so that points maybe to some directory on this FTP server that I mentioned. And then we have also some output path, so that points to some storage container where later our data will be going to. And then also this big thing here, this is uh, our tasks configurations. So let's say we have multiple different kinds of CSV file files on the server. We would like to say, specify a task, one each for each type of CSV file, and then be able to also say, okay, things like a read and write option here. Yeah, this is a CSV file, so maybe we need to say what separate, separate it has, what delimiter it has, 
also whether it has a header or not, right? And also we want to specify the schema because it seems to be pretty, let's say, in stable format, so we want to check it against the schema so that it doesn't get ingested wrongly. So that's why we, we have these class configurations here. So now before I go into the code, I want to say, um, I tried to make it more simple, so there's probably some things missing. So I just want to get some ideas across, so bear with me if it's, if it's not all clear. So, um, Let's say we program now this load configuration uh, logic. So, um, as I mentioned, we specify we specify now a bunch of things in our string file, and uh, now we want to make it usable. So, for that, we use the type safe config library, which is available in Scala, and from there we use the config factory class, which comes with the pass string method. So, we take this configuration string that we looked at here and we parse it first of all. And then, to make it usable, um, we use something that we call the use case config object, which I will show you in a minute. And with this object, we basically um, make sure that all of those items are usable, so we have like types with them and stuff like this. Okay, um, yeah, the use case config object that I mentioned before is a companion object, so we have um, the companion, also, so the companion of the use case config is our is a case class, the use case config case class, and there we will specify all sorts of uh, configurations, yeah, matching those that we saw at the very beginning in the config file. For example, the input base path that I mentioned there. So we want to match this and make sure that our uh, config file uh, does exactly that, right? Because then we can uh, convert it to the to the types. So for that we have this case match statement here. Yeah, in the, in the fly uh, factory method. And so <coughs> let's say it matches. So the user has specified all the configurations correct. We will uh, return the config. Otherwise, uh, we throw an error. Okay. So we can tell the user now you configured something that isn't there. If that was successful, uh, we write this um, this config as a config <coughs> value so that we can actually use it later. Okay. Um, okay, now we have specified our configuration logic, it's all working, so now we can do something. <coughs> Let's say from our main in the project, uh, we use something, the ingestion task, yeah, this is what we're going to program, the ingestion task. For every CSV file that we have, we will have one ingestion task, and this uh, runs some execute method on these files. So we essentially iterate through all those tasks, create a new task <coughs> config we have for each task, and then uh, yeah, execute, as I mentioned, the, the method on that. So um, now you might be curious what the ingestion task looks like, so uh, the class is the class here, if you can see it. Um, and it takes on some different things. For once, the task config that we talked about already coming up here from the loop, but also implicitly, we take this Spark session, because we always need it everywhere, uh, the config that we discussed earlier, that we just generated, and the source file system, so this is the source file system on the SFTP server, and we're extending the thing with the logging because we need logging everywhere, right? We want to write everywhere some logs. Okay, now maybe you are curious what the execute uh, method looks like from the inside, so I'll show you that. And particularly, uh, let's just talk about reading the data, right? So what we do here is we will iterate through all the files belonging to one task. And, uh, yeah, it, and read this data. Okay. For that, we have this reflex length method. It's, it's just the call of the Spark read. Right? So it's just the, the, the read call of the, the Spark API. So you notice here that we are reading this data as a data set of string. So you might be like, oh, this is weird, because in Spark, maybe for those who are familiar, you could just call the read CSV function. 
But why we do this here is because we want to validate that our data is correctly formatted. So you don't want to lend data that is not following the schema so you don't cause downstream problems. And that's why first we read it as a raw, just as a bunch of strings, and then we apply def different validation steps on it. So I will continue with the validation. So it's pretty simple actually, we just have another ingestion validation uh, object, which then has some validate logic inside. And um, what we do is we, we pass the raw data to it, and um, yeah, then check if it's okay. So if our, we say basically if our validation result is empty, so if everything is okay in that case, we just continue processing. And if it's not okay for this file, we will stop processing. So maybe now you ask, uh, okay, the suggestion validation validate thing, uh, what does it look like? So essentially it's just an object in which we define different methods. Sorry, I was not doing here. Anyways, so what this one says is um, validate data frame not empty. So this is maybe the first check you want to do with the CSV file, right, that it's not empty. So what we do is we look inside and we check, okay, is the raw count greater than one? Yes. Then we, re we return right, right, so in this case an empty unit, let's see here. And else we throw a validation error, right, and we return it actually, as we defined up here in the case class, you know, with the message so that later the user can also see maybe what file was empty. So, um, yeah. so let's say now all the reading, all the validation happened successfully, and after that, um, I'm not gonna explain the code part for this, because of time reasons, but essentially what you can do afterwards is apply some transformations. For example, you hash the data because you have some GDPR requirements, or, um, yeah, you aggregate something. And um, after that, you just write it to your storage system. Um, yeah, so in summary, it is possible to design robust and scalable data processing jobs in Scala and using the Spark API. We saw some um, examples of this, how it could look like. Also, we can achieve a high degree of reusability using the configuration files, meaning we can deploy multiple jobs using the same code, which is really nice. So we can onboard use cases quickly. And also we can take off the burden of downstream entities by validating the data before it gets landed. So at least the schema is correct and some simple things like that. So do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, first question, can you show again uh, what configuration looks like and who is uh, creating this uh, configuration? Sure. Like from the business side. Yeah, sure. Um, you mean this part? Uh, no, the I think the, the one where I showed the example JSD. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, this is the, the configuration, right? Yes, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. And who is uh, defining this uh, configuration? So the data engineers uh, define it. So every data engineer has a use case that they now Kubernetes, who um, takes care of a use case. And we um, have these underlying, we call it a framework. So we configure this framework. But we also maintain and extend this framework. So we do both the configuration and the programming of the framework, the job. And how many, uh, like, are the use cases um, very similar, or do they cover like many, many use cases that are used with this uh, platform? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so um, we, we have more than one framework. Mm -hmm. So generally for some CSV files and some let's say, structured data, we use one framework, but also we are extending now to streaming and so on and jurisdictions and stuff. But essentially, yeah, so the use cases have some similarity, yes. So usually it's uh, some batch processing. Yeah. yeah. Some structured data. Since this seems to revolve around CSV files, 
I mean, read the CSV file is just a table structure, right? And so what often happens from my experience is that you get, when you get CSV files, it often contains data that is not in any kind of normal form, like relational normal form. And what I wonder is if there's a, if you have implemented any sort of automated techniques for recovering uh, like for normalizing the data in the CSV file. You mean like flattening? No, normalizing in, uh, in the terms of uh, SQL normal forms. Ah, okay. Um, we do not, uh, because everything of the modeling we do later. So, if there's any modeling in the database. So, this is basically the first step. We just learn data, but it can come from multiple sources. But if there is some sort of modeling to be done, it will happen later in the database. I see. Mm -hmm. I had a similar question to the first one, and I gathered that you are trying to create some form of platform. Mm -hmm. And are you following a Databricks uh, architecture style of creating a central lake house, or are you using decentralized approaches like data mesh? Um, we are using data mesh. Ah, yeah. Good. Maybe another question. Mm -hmm. um, do you try to use the data set API consistently, or uh, so are you actually trying to type all the rows uh, always, which would be more like a Scala based question in the talk <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in contrast to the data frame API, where you ah, actually. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. That's what you're yeah, yeah. No, actually, we like to avoid it, um, but if we have to. Avoid so, for example, if we have parquet files, we would not do that, right? Because then we don't have to validate the, the structure because it comes with metadata, for example. So in that case, we wouldn't do, we wouldn't read as a data set. We would right away read with the read parquet function. Train. Yes. Hmm? Oh, yeah. uh, in your case, how long does these uh, CSVs uh, files stay stable? <laughs> So, for example, the structure you, you have defined, mm -hmm. is it uh, common that it really stays for a longer time stable, or how do you do it then with, uh, yeah? Like uh, drift? Yeah, drift or yeah, changes in the structure. Mm -hmm. So, um, I would say, so we really enforce it. So, we have agreements with our partners about the schema and how the data should look like. So, if there are some changes, then uh, there's a Negotiations about it sounds cumbersome, but sometimes it's just like, hey, uh, we need another field, uh, can we extend it? But it would be some, there's some formalized approach to it, so not suddenly they add another column and we're like, oh my god, <laughs> nothing works. So. Maybe also another API question from Spark. Then have you evaluated using unification of batch and streaming? So to use the streaming API always for the declarative approach, and then maybe also with an executed as batch processing, or, or do you actually decide against that and uh, deliberately use Spark SQL and not continue to use it? Uh, good question. Actually, we just started with streaming, so I'm not so okay. sure yet. We're still in the beginning of it. Okay. So unfortunately, we cannot answer your question. Okay. Thank you.